had the meetings, I was involved in them, I knew the teachers, I, I, I knew their friends, I, I monitored where they went, I talked to them. We, we, we you can get caught up too, just because you're protecting and you're afraid and you know that your life is in danger and you gotta do whatever you need to do to be okay. We had never dealt with this in either side of the family before. And I'm like, no, it can't be. Not in our lovely family. A short time ago, a group of people brought together with a common struggle shared their realities of addiction and behaviors they themselves confront in order to help their loved one and in the process, save themselves. We have been invited into their private group to listen and learn. The situations are real and the consequences serious. As you'll see, addiction is not an isolated process. Everyone the addict interacts with is impacted and the damage can be unrepairable if not challenged. In this module, we are going to look at enabling and codependency. But before launching into these important topics, it's important to understand the true ramifications of addiction. Camera A, camera B, coming, Mark. One's up. So there were times that were more difficult than others, and I wonder if some of you would be willing to share some of those times for you that were, were more difficult early in, in the process before you knew what you know now. Well, one of the things that was most destructive in my life is that Mark has two daughters, and um, we knew we had a problem before he even got married, but he had a long period of sobriety. And during that time, he got married, and they had these two little girls. Well, then Mark started drinking again, and I tried to talk to the girls about it, and they said, well, Mommy says if Daddy really loved us, he would stop drinking. And that you and Granddad give him money. That tore my heart out. And to this day, these girls are 17 and 19 now. And we, we're just now starting to get a better relationship with them. So it really has torn the family apart. Well, for us, I remember when our oldest daughter was drinking and I would say to Dennis, I smelled alcohol on her. And he'd go, no, <laughs> and pass it off. And I'd say, yes, I did. I, and we'd really get into these fights about it and what to do about it. Um, and then finally, we did with the recommendation of a friend do an intervention and she went to the old St. Luke's program and I remember them calling us in that very first day say, talking about the elephant in the living room <laughs> and how everybody ignores it and it's so obvious and I'm like no it can't be not in our lovely family. This isn't anything I pictured. This can't be. And really, all I could do was weep. I was so upset, and it just was so beyond my control. I think even though I was still trying to control it, I knew it wasn't in my hands. And some of those things, to me, fall under the uh, uh, those unseen portions mm -hmm. of the ripple effect, you know, and they're out there and they're very real and sometimes maybe what we're not aware of or what's not right there in our face can be uh, the most difficult or the, uh, or the most um, painful. We wouldn't hear from our daughter for a long time. She was on the west coast and homeless and I just remember the one time that we flew out there, rented a car, <clears throat> She was on the street, and the last day we're going to leave, and uh, we saw her there, and uh, then we said goodbye to her, 
And I remember we were going down, <clears throat> down to the car that was at the curb, and Julia and I were sitting there, and we were sort of like weeping, thinking, well, this is probably the last time we're going to see her. You know, we, first we thought, was well, she going to jump out the window or what, you know? And uh, so we just sort of sat there. And about maybe 10 minutes later, she comes out. And she comes to the car and she's, she says, I love you, you know. Mm. But that was, you know, one of those moments when, <clears throat> um, you know, we didn't have anywhere to go. We didn't have any tools, we didn't have anywhere to go. But I kept going back to that thinking, you know, I don't wanna, I don't wanna feel this every day. And if, uh, as parents, as family members, as spouses, whatever it is, uh, you know, we grieve their loss even before the ultimate, before death. No, no parent, no person should have to go through that. But yet, um, I went through that, uh, you know, and at one point I had the thought, I said, you know what, God, I, I wish you were dead. I just wish it was over. And in the split moment after thinking that, um, I felt horrible. And I said, no, I don't. and I didn't. I didn't wish him dead. I just wanted it to be over yeah. because it felt mm -hmm. like I, I've already prepared myself emotionally to have to bury him, and then he would reappear. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then it would happen over and over again, and it, it was like that yo-yo effect emotionally. But again, that's when I wasn't taking care of me. Uh, and that was one of those times that was particularly difficult. I come at this from a different direction than the rest of you. I don't have children, so I grew up in a family where uh, we we really were taught that if if a, a relative or a family friend was outrageously drunk and doing things that were completely inappropriate, that that the uh, the appropriate thing for us to do is to pretend it wasn't happening and to ignore it. And um, we we got really good at that. I mean, you just sort of, well, that this is normal, behavior that is not normal at all. And holidays could, were, it was like, you're either waiting for the disaster to happen, <laughs> or you're in the middle of the disaster, or you're trying to figure out how to get out of what was going on. Mm -hmm. And I was, I think I was 35 years old, and I remember where I was in the car driving home when I said to myself, you know, I'm not going to do this again. And the the feeling of sort of just complete liberation and taking my own power back to say, I'm just not going to have a drunk ruin another holiday in my life. I think my hardest moment was, I was raised in a family that was very, very close. And then my parents split up and it was, it turned, rocked our world. We'd been married a couple years and it rocked our world. And so for me to have our sons be close to each other is very, very important. And our younger son doesn't want anything to do with his brother. And I can't blame him, but it breaks my heart. Mm -hmm. he's, he's paid such a price. He's had friends desert him because of things his brother's done. He's had us, me particularly, come down on him because I'm you know, I'm, I'm, I'm upset at his brother and then he does something little and I go nuts. And so the family just feels so fractured and I feel, mm -hmm. I, it just, there's, I don't, can't do anything to make this better. It's still, that's, that, that hurts, that hurts bad. I think for me, when you ask the question, like what's the worst, it's like, you can't really say that because it seems like the worst gets even worse. Like yeah. when you think the first time when the the loved one wrecks the car, flips it over the highway, was able to walk away, get away, come to the house mm. and say the police are going to come, you need to tell the police that the car was stolen. Mm. And you're like yeah. really in the insanity of that and just thankful that he walked away. You know, thankful that he's okay. And then having to go without a car for nine, nine months, mm. and then going to the police station and saying, hey, you know, my car was stolen, and the police officer saying, no, you know, I don't want to take this report because they know the truth, and 
you think that that's the worst, mm -hmm. but it's not. <laughs> <laughs> and then you get another story where you're actually arrested this time, and you can't believe mm -hmm. it because you're like, how did this happen? You know. But that's the insanity of the disease. Mm -hmm. And there, and I agree. Uh, when we think it's the bottom, uh, it gets worse <laughs> mm -hmm. and worse and worse. You're you're absolutely right. Uh, anything is possible. Um, and that's the unfairness when we, particularly when we're enmeshed with them and, and taking responsibility for it. And, the, and that's why that concept of the letting go, love them, hating the disease is so essential. I have to get off the sinking ship. I got to get out yeah. of that quicksand uh, because it's not doing anything but lessening the consequences and I'm sinking with you. And we take our lives back uh, and we love them and, and, and should there be clarity, should they hit that bottom, then we're in a position to reach out and, and respond as opposed to taking responsibility for um, and again, that's a daily reminder, I think, for all of us. Things I can change and things I can't. The wisdom uh, to know the difference.